the federal budget is the primary tool of fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is conducted by the President and the Congress. Discretionary changes in fiscal policy are deliberate changes in government spending designed to affect the size of the budget deficit or surplus. A budget surplus is present when total government spending is less than total taxes collected from businesses and consumers for a given year. Surpluses reduce the magnitude of the government's outstanding debt, which is about $14 trillion, which is about the same as the value of our economic output for a given year. A budget deficit is present when total government spending exceeds total taxes collected from businesses and consumers for a given year. The 2009 budget deficit is about $1.4 trillion, or 10% of our economy's output and 10% of our government's outstanding debt. Deficits are typically covered by the Treasury borrowing by auctioning bonds. Changes in the size of the federal deficit or surplus are often used to gauge whether fiscal policy is stimulating or restraining aggregate demand, which arise from either a change in the state of the economy or a change in discretionary fiscal policy. The U.S. Treasury borrows to cover deficits by selling bonds to banks, large corporations, foreign governments, central banks, international organizations via bond auctions. Um, recently, the Federal Reserve, our central bank, announced its QE2 policy, or quantitative easing to policy, where they're going to literally purchase $600 billion in Treasury bonds directly from the Treasury. Now, <clears throat> Zimbabwe tried something similar, albeit at a more grand scale, on a more grand scale, on a bigger scale. Uh, it resulted in a hyperinflation of 135%. Now, we think 10% inflation is high, but in Zimbabwe, they had a 35 million percent inflation. Now, what does 135 million percent inflation mean to you? Well, suppose you buy something that costs a dollar. And over the course of the year, prices rose 135 million percent. Well, that one dollar, that item that costs one dollar, the increase in its price is 1.35 million dollars. So that item, maybe a Coca-Cola, that cost you a dollar at the beginning of the year, by the end of the year when faced with hyperinflation in the range of 135 million percent, that one dollar Coke would cost you one million three hundred fifty thousand and one dollar. And that happened in Zimbabwe a couple years ago. Now, government bonds have been issued by governments for a long time. Here's an example of a 1926 China Treasury bond. Here's an example of a 1949 Lebanon bond. A 1952 USSR bond. A 1922 Weimar Republic German bond. Here are two examples of USA Treasury bonds. The top one is a Civil War bond. The bottom one is a World War II bond. Okay, so you give the government money today to cover a budget deficit, and then in five, ten years, whatever the maturity is, they'll give you back the face value. The, the war bond on the bottom is a hundred dollar face value bond. So maybe you bought it for eighty bucks and then a couple years later, three or four years later, 1944, the Treasury gives you a hundred dollars. Okay. So it's kind of like Wimpy. I'll gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. You give the government eighty bucks today, Next Tuesday, they'll give you 100 bucks. That's kind of how they work. They're like promissory notes in the game of life. Now, here's a, a mock bond. And we're going to run a mock auction here. This treasury bond says, Know all men by these presents. This is to certify that Hal W. Snar is the owner of a United States American treasury bond that may be redeemed in 30 years in the amount of $1,000. Blah, 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 blah. The United States will, of America will pay the owner of this security interest in the amount of 0% of the face value each year following the date of issue until the date of maturity. So this bond 
because it pays 0% interest, is a zero coupon bond. In other words, you're not getting a coupon payment, an annual coupon payment, because the, it, the bond pays 0% interest while you hold it. We could also say that this bond is a thousand, it has a face value of $1,000 and a maturity of 30 years. So what you might do here is you might buy this at auction from Treasury, say for $400, maybe win the, the auction at $400. You give the Treasury $400 today. In 30 years, you give them back the bond and they give you $1,000 in cash. Okay. Now, would you pay more than $1,000 for this piece of paper? Probably not. You're probably not going to pay $900. You're probably not going to pay $800. Suppose you're the winner of this auction, and, you, and the winning bid was $400. Well, what is your interest rate? To, to find the interest rate, use the equation at the bottom here. With the face value being 1000 so replace FB with 1000 set that equal to bid, which in this case the winning bid was $400, multiply the 400 by 1 plus R and raise that quantity to the 30th power because in N in this case years to maturity is 30. Okay. Now you would divide that equation by 400 and on the left you would have 2.5 equal 1 plus R raised to the 30th. Now if you raise both sides of the equation by the power 1 divided by 30, you would raise 2.5, the thing on the left hand side, to the 1 divided by 30th power and you get 1.031. And that would equal 1 plus R. Now it's very simple, you subtract 1 from both sides. So the rate of interest that you would get from buying a bond with a winning bid of $400, you would earn 0.031 interest in decimal you'd earn 3.1 percent on your $400 investment. Now you may like the 3.1 percent but if you don't like the 3.1 percent don't bid $400. Okay. You know, so you might have stopped at 350 right instead of 400. Now if you think if you would have uh, if you want a real safe investment you might have, uh, you might think, well, 2% is okay. So you're going to bid more than $400. But if you think 3.1% is about um, the, the, the smallest the return can be, in your opinion, then you'd bid $400. Okay. Now, what could you have done with that $400? Well, you could have bought a pair of pants and uh, some groceries and maybe a cup of coffee. Right? Or you could have used the $400 to do what? Maybe lend some money to a guy to help him buy a car. And you could have charged him maybe a 5 or 10% interest rate. So there's a lot of things you could have done with your money besides give to the treasury. You could have uh, lent it to somebody to buy a house at 6%. Okay? So that's kind of how it works. Now the Keynesian view of fiscal policy highlights the potential of fiscal policy as a tool capable of reducing fluctuations in aggregate demand. Following the Great Depression, Keynesians challenged the view that governments should always balance their budget. Rather than balancing their budget annually, Keynesians argued that counter-cyclical policy should be used to offset fluctuations in aggregate demand. Expansion of fiscal policy should be used when the economy is weak. Now, when the economy is weak, we're in a recessionary gap. And a recessionary gap is the situation where real GDP is less than what it should be had the economy been at full capacity. And now we call economic output at full capacity potential output. In this regard, annual budget deficits can be used to close this gap if the government increases government purchase of goods and services or cuts our taxes. Restrictive fiscal policy should be used when strong demand threatens to cause inflation. In this situation, the government should run a surplus. Okay. Now, 
an inflationary gap exists if real GDP exceeds potential GDP. If real GDP is more than what we should be producing at 100% capacity. Now, what's wrong with real GDP being more than potential GDP or potential output? Well, typically in a case like that, unemployment is very, very low. So firms are having a hard time finding workers. So they're either paying the workers overtime, time and a half, so average wages go up, or if they want to expand, they got to, you know, entice workers to leave other firms and come to their firm to work, which means they got to maybe bump up their pay or, you know, offer them better benefits. So both those raise the average wage. Now, annual budget deficits can close this gap if the government reduces government spending and raises taxes. Now, the question is, is a politician, during a, a, a period of strong economic growth, are politicians really going to reduce government spending and raise your taxes? In the diagram below, the economy is in a recessionary gap because real GDP, denoted Y1, is less than potential output or full employment output, denoted Y subscript FE. Now, at equilibrium E1, the intersection of aggregate supply and aggregate demand, unemployment is high because we're not using all of our resources in the economy and, and labor is one of our many resources. Now, there are two routes to long-term full employment. One, one approach is to have a laissez-faire policy where you don't do anything, the government doesn't do anything, and the economy will fix itself. Okay. Now, the economy can fix itself because when there's high unemployment, wages fall. And wages are falling because it's hard to find a job. So if you're unemployed, recently unemployed, and you're making $15 an hour, you have two kids, a wife, or you you got a husband at home uh, being Mr. Mom, you have the two kids. Well, if you're making 15 before the recession started, then you lost your job, you might take a job making 12 bucks an hour because you need to provide for your family. So in a situation like this, Wages and prices both fall, prices of other production inputs. And down below we have red arrows above the money wage rate and the price of other production inputs. The money wage rate comes down because people are unemployed and they're, uh, they're looking for work. And if you have kids, you might you want to take that pay cut. The economy, since businesses are you know, maybe operating at maybe 75% of capacity instead of 100%, they're not really using a lot of resources. They're not using a lot of energy. So in a recession gap, energy prices tend to fall because firms aren't operating at 100%. Now, when the economy starts growing, uh, firms will bid up energy prices because now they're going from 75% capacity to 100% capacity. So in a recessionary gap, if government doesn't do anything, Wages and, price, wages and prices of other production inputs tend to fall. The Keynesians believe that allowing for the market to self-adjust, they, they think that's a lengthy process and it's kind of painful, right? Because you went from making 15 to, say, making 12, so it's harder to make ends meet. Um, I think that the process is lengthy because we have things like unemployment benefits being extended. We have, um, welfare programs, we have food stamps programs. If we didn't have food stamp programs and extended unemployment benefits and other public assistance programs, the reservation wage of a worker would drop much more rapidly. But if you know you're getting unemployment for 26 weeks and then it's extended 99 weeks, you're less likely to take a, a job that's going to pay you less. So you wait, you wait out the recession for maybe a, a job that was paying you about the same. 